Hey, welcome to Ask a Pastor. I'm joined by Brady Randall, who pastors our Butler County campus, and we're excited just to have a few minutes to spend with you today. On Ask a Pastor, uh, we're going to be talking about several issues that different people have submitted uh, via question. If you have questions, you can send them to Ask a Pastor at Orchard Hill church.com and we will be happy to interact with them and if uh, you're regular uh, to listening to this especially via the podcast any likes or um, kind of subscriptions are really helpful so even if you listen on Facebook or somewhere else if you can go and subscribe on the podcast that just helps others find that content as well so Brady uh, welcome thanks for joining us today and uh, the first question we have is um, about fasting, and it's basically how and why was this done in the times of the Bible, and how or why should we practice it today? Yeah, and that's sort of an interesting question coming out of Lent. Many Christians around the world sort of celebrate that. A lot of people fast or give up something. And while it's not a direct command in Scripture, from my understanding, um, Jesus seemed to assume that his followers would fast, Uh, When he talks in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, he says, when you fast, as if there's an understanding that will be a part of a follower of Jesus. Um, And he said, was when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites who make it plain that they're they're fasting and their faces look like it. But, you know, go and do it in secret and your father who sees what is done will reward you. And uh, there's there's a lot of instances with people in scripture uh, fasting. Um, oftentimes it was for preparing for a certain season or ministry. In fact, that's how Jesus sort of began his, his public ministry was a period of 40 days in the desert uh, fasting. And, and fasting almost entirely in scripture is often coupled with prayer. It's not just fast, but it's coupled with prayer. It's a way to say, I, I want more of you, God. I want to see more of you in my life. I want to see more of your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Uh, People would fast, uh, they would couple fasting with repentance, and often when I say fast, it's often giving up, in most cases, food. Um, And so, you know, today when people fast, it doesn't necessarily have to be food, it could be social media or sports or television. Um, But but there was also people would fast uh, when they were making important decisions. In the early church in Acts, uh, they were selecting elders and people would fast uh, and pray and ask God for discernment. And um, I think one of the best texts about fasting in Scripture is Isaiah 58. And a lot of people can think of fasting as as a way to sort of curry God's favor. Like if I fast, God will honor that. And in fact, in Isaiah 58, that people were fasting and God says, I'm not looking at that. That the kind of fasting that I've chosen is that you would be about justice and and my name and and then you you know you will shine like like the noonday and so uh, that's that's a great text but uh, preparation repentance uh, fasting can help with worship there was a woman named Anna who was worshiping in the temple and she was fasting and so there's a variety of ways to fast and I would say um, again it's not a way to to gain God's favor it's a way to say Lord I want I want more of you Um, and in fact you know, when you think about giving up food, um, sometimes other things come to the surface. Maybe you'll fast for 24 hours and things, maybe there's different idols in your life. They'll just sort of come out. And it's like, man, that, that's sort of what was in there, Lord. And the other thing I would say about uh, fasting is, um, again, it's not a way to say, God, now you have to honor what I've done. It's a way to say, Lord, you know, I could give up food, but the reality is if I eat food, in four more hours, I'm going to be hungry again. And and Jesus said that he is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's what we're ultimately fasting for. We're longing for more of God, more of God's glory in his kingdom. So if I were to put a definition on it, based on what you just said, it would be basically some kind of self-denial for a spiritual purpose would that be a fair definition i I think that i think that makes sense i think it's it's a little broader than that but it is uh, there is a a sense of self-denial broader broader aspect well i just think about isaiah 58 it's not just a giving up something it's actually being for uh justice in in fact i I love that text and i won't i won't read it all now Um, but but god says there in isaiah 58 on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit workers. Uh, your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. Uh, you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. And then he goes on to say, the kind of fast that I have chosen is not just a day for people to humble themselves, um, 
but rather to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of yoke, to set the oppressed free. Uh, is it not to share your food with the hungry, provide the poor wonder with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them, not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? And, and he goes on. So I, that's why I say it's a little, so, little so broader. Yeah, and I think that would be your spiritual purpose right. side. Yeah. Giving up something for a spiritual purpose for sure. saying I'm about more. But, but it sounds like when you read that, what that really is saying to us is that we have to be careful that you don't fast and see it as an end in itself. Right. Because if your life isn't lining up in the cause of justice and you fast, you're actually in a way making yeah. a mockery of yeah. God rather than, than in a sense, honoring God. That's we, right. Okay. So, so for somebody who says, I've never really gone without food. I've heard about intermittent fasting mm -hmm. uh, for health reasons. Maybe I should try this thing. What, what, what's your wisdom for somebody? Yeah, you, you know... When I got this question, it was it was actually convicting for me because actually, to be honest, I it's been a while since I've coupled prayer with, with fasting, um, and and one of my excuses for, for not is is I'm on some medication for migraines and I shouldn't go without food for a long period of time, and, but then I was reminded that you know fasting doesn't just have to be food, and, and for me I think a healthy fast might be you know give up social media or give up, uh, you know, watching the, the, the pirates or sports um, and taking that time intentionally to be with God. That's not self-sacrificial. Come on. <laughs> you don't know who you're talking to here. I do. I'm uh, just, I'm just so. playing. Um, no. So, so yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I hear that and I agree with it. I also think that sometimes the Christian community can be quick to say, let me sub other things for the the technical definition of forgoing food mm -hmm. and that sometimes saying I'm going to forgo some food, feel some hunger to be reminded of my need for mm -hmm. Jesus and and to seek him mm -hmm. is just a helpful thing. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned intermittent fasting because I think sometimes people will will almost say, well, I'm fasting and I'm doing it to lose weight or for health reasons and then try to make it spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's backwards. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to say, if I'm going to practice this, do this to seek God, um, get your physical things met in other ways. Mm -hmm. And then if, if, you, if, if you can, then that's, that, that, that's a healthier approach. And I, and I think it's fine for some people to say, let me cut off social media, let me mm -hmm. you know, fast from you sure. know, whatever it is, golf, pirates, right. Right. You know, things of that nature. Yeah. But, but, but I think that the, the real key as I've watched this is saying, I need to break from something that I normally do and deny myself in some sense in order to seek God. Mm -hmm. And and it's, if I don't seek God in it, yeah. then the denial hasn't been complete. Mm -hmm. And and if I seek God while still doing everything else, then I haven't practiced fasting. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. just sought God, which is a good thing. Sure. Um, but But there's something that happens when you put those things together that God almost multiplies mm -hmm. your, your seeking of him. And I think that's the point of yeah. people saying in seasons of peak discernment, um, have I done this in order to say, I want to make sure that my, my brain is as, as, as um, able as possible to discern mm -hmm. the voice of God mm -hmm. or the direction of God in, yeah. in something that I'm doing. So, yeah, so yeah thanks. Um, so uh, a second question is uh, about communion. It says, is close, closed communion a biblical idea? And probably what, what's in view here, if you're not familiar with the idea of closed or open communion, is some churches practice what's called closed communion, meaning only members of that church can take communion. So if you've ever been to, say, a Catholic Mass and you're not Catholic, um, the Catholic Church generally practices closed communion, meaning if you're not a Catholic, they say, we're glad you're here, but don't come partake of this sacrament in this church because this isn't your faith that you own. Other churches practice open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of the church. They just say, if you're a follower of Jesus, come and partake. So, so, so help us understand just a little bit about this idea of closed or open communion in terms of a biblical rationale. Yeah, I, I think probably when churches uh, operate with a sort of a closed, more restricted communion, uh, what they're trying to do, there, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul talks about uh, someone can sort of uh, take communion in an unworthy manner. And 
I think oftentimes churches that, that celebrate a, a closed communion, they want to make sure people are in good standing, sort of not eating and drinking judgment on themselves. They want to sort of protect uh, the sacrament that Jesus said to offer, and so they restrict it so that there's not a lot of maybe hypocrisy or that they think that they're actually helping protect someone from eating um, in an unworthy manner. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you read 1 Corinthians 11, uh, it's sort of an interesting passage where some people are getting sick, some people are dying as mm -hmm. a result of, of that, and that's a whole other, you know, got to get into that context. But that's a pretty serious thing that Paul talks about in it churches. Is serious. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, so... No way around it. Uh, so churches, I think that's sort of the heart behind it, wanting to protect it. Mm -hmm. um, but then you sort of become the communion police or maybe the morality police or maybe you're not in good standing or you're in certain sin and maybe it's the elders or the pastor. Um, <clears throat> it, it can become a little bit selective and I think that's where maybe some of the, the problem could lie with that. But I think the heart behind it is to say we want to honor this sacrament. We want to make sure people are not drinking and eating in an unworthy manner. Right. Well, one of the ways I've heard it explained is is it's wise to fence the table, mm -hmm. meaning to say here are some of the parameters. <clears throat> um, if you're in a church context that takes communion on a fairly regular basis, it's hard to say the same thing every single time you step up and you know put five minutes of caveat and fence around mm -hmm. it. Uh, um, and so sometimes you know maybe you state it really clearly. Sometimes it's a little less clear or fully stated. But I think the concept of saying, hey, here's who this is for, mm -hmm. and don't come do this if it isn't for you, mm -hmm. is a healthy concept. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and at the same time, I, I like what you said about you want to be careful you don't become the morality police. It seems mm -hmm. like in a lot of churches that what happens is there are there are sins that are known and obvious that, mm. that the church will take a stand on and say, mm -hmm. well, you can't take communion. You can't be in membership. You can't be in leadership if these things are true. And then there are a whole host of sins that, that it's like, well, nobody really talks about it or makes a deal of it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I've, I've probably said at different times is, is in American culture, rarely do, do people in the church call out other Christians for consumerism or greed. Mm -hmm. um, we just assume that it's the American way of life and that the only person who's greedy is somebody who might have more than me, mm -hmm. but it can't possibly be me. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so, you know, like with communion, people may say, well, if you're going through acts, you can't come to take communion. But greedy people, we're all good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where you run mm -hmm. into danger. Now, the flip side of that is as soon as you start saying, well, because we don't call out one thing, we're not going to call out the other. Mm -hmm. um, that, that also can be its own self-defeating thing because then you never say anything about anything mm -hmm. if that's your rationale. But, but, but there's a, I've been able to sleep really well at night as a pastor saying my job is to explain it and then to let people make their decision. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That it isn't my job necessarily to stand there and go, yes, no, yes, no. Mm -hmm. My job is to say, here it is. And if you feel right before God, then you can come. If not, um, then you, you know you should take precautions. Yeah. That, that to me feels like it's a sufficient enough mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah, good. Um, so the last question here, Brady, is, um, and this is from a student in our student ministry. They asked several of the students just for questions that they'd be interested in. Uh, it was help us understand the Trinity. Wow. So, uh, so, so, so let's hear you, uh, you know, in just a couple minutes, explain yeah. the Trinity in succinct and compelling form. Wow. Well, these students are in good standing with uh, Christians and theologians across the ages. I mean, this, is, this has been a controversial topic in the church. This has led to different heresies in the church. This has led to really wise, godly men and women coming together in councils, trying to understand what is the truthfulness of Scripture, what is being said, and how do we understand it? Um, how does our... How does our does it transcend reason? Maybe not irrational, but does it go beyond uh, just logic and reason? And I think what, what people have said is that in Scripture, um, there's a, a theme throughout Scripture that God is one. In fact, Deuteronomy 6 it talks about God being one, and then you, yet you read about, uh, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You, you see that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and yet the Holy Spirit is considered divine, a divine person, a divine being. Jesus says the Father and I are one, and yet they're 
distinct. And so while you don't see the term Trinity in the scriptures, the concept of God being one, and they've just hard, it's hard to, to describe what one what, one, um, one essence, uh, but three distinct persons. And, and by that we mean God is one substance. All right, all right, so hold on. <laughs> let, let, let me, I, I know you're about to get to the good part yeah, of it, but yeah. hang on. So uh, I just had flashbacks to seminary there. So, so you have a three-year-old son, right? Nash yeah, is three? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so, so fast forward two years. Imagine Nash is five. Yeah. And he says, Dad, explain the Trinity to me. Let, let, yeah. Let's back off the seminary okay. and give it to me like I'm five-year-old right. Nash. Well, here's the thing. I've, I've heard some analogies that help you sort of understand it, but they're also heretical at the same time. Like I've heard people say, you know, the Trinity is sort of like water, right? It can be liquid, gas, and ice. I say, okay, that's three different things, but, but the Trinity is not different modes. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard some people say the Trinity is like, you know, like a person. A person is a father and an uncle and a brother. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I would say, bordering on heresy because the, the, it's not like God puts on different masks. Mm -hmm. um, one such analogy that I think is helpful, maybe you can help if this is, if this is helpful. Um, a man named Augustine came up with the analogy of, of sort of the mind being it's, it's the will and understanding and reason. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what you do with that. Mm -hmm. um, people have talked about the analogy of like a three-leaf clover, like a stem and the leaves. And here's, here's how the best sort of way that I've sort of wrapped my mind around it. And maybe this is above a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think of the idea of marriage, um, two people becoming one. Mm -hmm. Now, that's sort of mysterious, but you, you can understand that from a physical standpoint, kind of coming together or in one accord. And so um, I think that's helpful in seeing how two distinct people can sort of be one coherent unit while being totally distinct at the same time. The, the marriage analogy helps me get my, mm -hmm. my head around it. Have you heard any like mm -hmm. really solid analogies where you'd say this is really, mm -hmm. like I said, water? That's understandable, but that's, I think, can be heretical, too. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard any really good... Yeah, well, good... I've heard people use the pretzel, you know, if it's got three things. Okay. Uh, you know, I think the analogies, as you said, they all have some danger because mm -hmm. if they're taken too far, um, like the idea of water, you end up with, to use a seminary word, modalism, mm -hmm. um, where you have three different modes of God mm -hmm. um, that he acts in. Um, rather than it's one God always the same as, you know, you said distinct in three persons. You know, if I were, were to try to explain it to, to a five-year-old or so, somebody who's, who's really new to thinking about faith, probably the first thing I would do is say, this probably isn't fully understandable even by somebody who's, who's been around a long time, mm -hmm. studied a lot, in that, in that, you probably don't want a God that you can completely explain and categorize mm -hmm. because that probably defeats the whole definition or point of a God that would be worthy of worship. But having said that, I would say that, that God the Father is, is, the, um, is the one who controls and is sovereign over everything. Certainly that doesn't mean that Jesus or the Holy Spirit are not because mm -hmm. that's where you get into modalism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you know different persons. Jesus became the tangible physical expression of God. Mm -hmm. um, again, not that the others are not expressions of God, but uh, you know, Hebrews 1 tells us that he's the exact representation, that, that that's how you get a window into who God is. This is what helps us get our hand around mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And then the spirit is the abiding presence, the ongoing presence of God, and that, and that you need all three to have a full picture, and yet all three are distinct. Um, and, and so, you know, is there a good analogy? Um, you know, you, you use the analogy of marriage. I think if you just think about a person, again, to a five-year-old and to say, you know, you as a dad to say, well, I as your dad, sometimes I'm your dad. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm Susan's husband. Sometimes I'm the pastor of Orchard Hill Butler mm -hmm. County. And I'm always all of those. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those matter. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, not one when I'm the other. Right. But I function in all three realms. Mm -hmm. um, that's close, but it still leaves you a little empty. And again, I'd go back to why we can't fully yeah. understand that. And probably, again, if I could fully understand God, um, there would be a piece of me that would say, 
okay, then there's no mystery, nothing to, to, yeah. to worship or ponder. One, one way I've heard it expressed that I think is helpful is in terms of thinking about salvation mm. and, and the three A's so that God the Father authors salvation, uh, Jesus the Son accomplishes salvation, and the Holy Spirit applies salvation to the believer. Mm -hmm. I thought that's sort of an interesting way to mm -hmm. sort of conceptualize that. And um, the, the other thing I think that's, that's helpful about the Trinity, that God has existed for all time. And so some people have said, oh, God needed to create humans so he wasn't lonely, that sort of thing. And, and I think what the thing that the, the Trinity demonstrates is that God is totally complete in and of himself. And so he, the reason that you and I enter the picture is, is purely out of God's love for us. It's not that he lacks anything, mm -hmm. so he had to create us. And I thought that was helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and this, I just wanted to read this quote. Um, there was a guy named Bruce Milne, and he said this about the Trinity. Uh, you sort of alluded to this, but he said, for all of its difficulty, the Trinity is simply the price to be paid for having a God who is great enough to command our worship and service. And so there's just something that's, Wow, the, the concept is there, and are we going to totally get it? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Uh, but but mm -hmm. it, the truthfulness is there. How can we sort of understand it, digest it, and at the end of the day say, Wow, God, you're, you are so much more above us. Your thoughts and your ways are so much higher than ours, and the Trinity, the, the concept is, is, I think, part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Well, thank you, Brady. And uh, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to send them to Ask a Pastor at Orchard Hill Church. Dot com. We'll be happy to address them in future episodes, times of uh, discussion around this. Uh, Brady, give us a quick uh, update about Butler County. Uh, how's it going for the campus there and uh, the work there? Yeah, we're really excited. God is really uh, on the move at Orchard Hill Butler Campus and uh, been really excited about people, you know, coming out of Easter and uh, needing to find some more space and more more parking space and it's, it's just been a lot of fun uh, it's been great to see all the kids there and events yeah. that we have around there we're really looking forward to the summer months to even you know some churches sort of take it easy we're looking forward to really ramp up ministry and connection having people connect uh, to god connect to people and really connect to the the butler community so we're excited about what has happened and we're really excited about the future as well. Yeah, we live in a time when a lot of churches struggle just to have people, and it's great when a campus or a church's struggle is to have enough place to put everybody, mm. and that's uh, kind of where we've been in Butler County. So thanks. Uh, again, send any questions to askapastor at orchardhillchurch.com. Have a great day.